good afternoon, everybody. Happy International Women's Day. Uh, delighted to have everybody here and delighted to talk to this wonderful panel of female leaders, or, or leaders who are female, I suppose, the best way of describing them um, this morning. So my name is Laura Lynch. I'm the founder of a strategic tax and advisory practice. I'm based in Galway. Um, so I set up the practice myself almost five years ago. It's actually predominantly female, um, but in, in a male environment in terms of who our competitors are and who our clients are, because we would be what we call the tax advisor to the entrepreneur, looking after the 360 approach to themselves and their business and their family, etc. So we need to understand all of that. And I suppose how we do that is by being business owners ourselves. Um, I am joined by three fabulous women this morning who will tell us a little bit about themselves and their leadership journeys. And maybe we'll start with that. If I could ask each of you to introduce yourselves and give us a little bit of background to who you are, who you work with and your leadership journey. Michelle, do you want to kick us off? No problem, Laura. Uh, my name is Michelle Vance. I'm CEO of Lily O'Brien's. Um, in the role the last 12 months, February 2020 is when I took up the role. Uh, leadership journey is probably a lengthy one. Um, I have a background in a, a multitude of industries going back to my very first roles, which would have been uh, manufacturing based packing pizzas in uh, Green Off Foods and Nace way back in 1994. So, um, from there on, I would have moved into working in admin and finance, HR, uh, moving from payroll into finance, uh, training as an accountant in Freshways uh, Sandwiches up in Finglas um, and qualifying as a, an accountant in that role. Um, I moved from there into a logistics and warehouse, very family-based uh, business in uh, Nace and Newbridge. And I spent five fantastic busy years working logistics and warehousing. And in 2011, 2008, 2011, sorry, I joined Lily O'Brien's and I joined as a contractor uh, to help out for uh, two weeks. And uh, nearly 12 years later, I'm still here um, and sitting in the main uh, CEO chair. So it's it's been a, a journey of learning along the way, um, but a fantastic one at that. Great. I'm looking forward to hearing about that journey in a bit more detail later, Michelle. Nicola, what about you? Um, morning, Laura, and happy International Women's Day. It's great to be here. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, my journey started, I suppose, in Galway, which is where I'm, like yourself, I'm, I'm based in Galway now. I wasn't always based in Galway. Um, grew up here, went to university here, um, kind of was involved in a, my family had a tourism business, so I was very involved at, at that, kind of from, from, from the get-go, I suppose, I could understand how businesses worked, having worked in one from a very young age, but enjoyed it, enjoyed all of that, so that led me on to going to university in Galway and graduating with a BCom degree. And at the end of that, the um, accounting firms came calling from the UK and said, you know, kind of we're on a milk round, and the offer came in then to go to the UK, train there as a chartered accountant. So having kind of been in Galway for most of my life I kind of went for a uh, and the opportunity to go to London and you know spent what I thought were going to be three short years there just graduating and, and qualifying as an accountant but when you got to London the opportunities were just immense um, in respect of where you could go what companies you could join and um, so I kind of my leadership roles really started there in in the UK working in kind of multinational American multinational companies um, and then ending up in my last role in a, um, a music industry, actually, Sharon, in, 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 that, in that industry. And it was part of Virgin Media. It was one of the subsidiaries of Virgin Media was my last, was my last role. And I suppose was the role where I kind of culminated in, in, came in becoming an FD of that, of that company. And then I suppose uh, throughout, throughout that journey, I you know, met, fell in love with my husband, had two children. And there was always that kind of call thinking, would we, would we come back to, to Ireland? Would we come back to Galway? And we always thought, well, Galway would be the place we'd want to come back to, having both myself and my husband are from Galway. And um, two, we had two children at the time. We now, we now have subsequently have four children. But the, the role came up in the university. So where I'm working now is the, the head of financial planning at the, at the university here in Galway. And this role came up. And it was actually my father who sent on the advertisement that I feel your parents are fairly 
pivotal in, in, in some respects in, in kind of leading and guiding you um, through, through your life's journey. So he saw the ad, sent it over to me and I said, I'll give it a go. You know, and you know, we're, I'm almost 20 years later back in, back in Galway with no regrets, but in, in the university. So that's my short history. Brilliant. Thanks, Nicola. And, and let's talk about that a bit more later. And Sharon, Sharon, finally yourself as well, CEO of Music Network. Tell us about yourself. Thank you also um, for inviting me. I think it's afternoon now, so delighted to be here today. And yes, I'm Sharon Rolston. I'm originally from County Armagh um, and I'm the CEO of Music Network, which is a national touring music touring and development organization. I suppose I've always been involved in the arts, even as a young child. I loved literature, visual art, music. And so that's kind of been my path since a very early age. And my degree, which I studied at University of Ulster, was in the visual arts. Um, and then I actually worked as an artist for maybe six, seven years. And I suppose that gave me, you know, direct experience of how difficult it is to um, make a career as an artist in this country. So eventually I was drawn towards arts management and in my late twenties then I um, from then worked in a, a number of different types of organizations, arts and disability, children's arts, um, eventually music. And then after that, I uh, came down to Kilkenny to the then Crafts Council, which was kind of, um, I think where I suppose closest to my, um, degree subject, which was actually silversmithing and jewellery. But um, despite that, I was drawn back to music and I came up to Dublin in 2008 to work for Music Network as the programs manager initially. Um, and then the then CEO um, went out on maternity leave in 2011 and I had the opportunity to try the role for six, well, perhaps a little bit more, nine months and um, try it for size. I suppose it was a very different concept in my head. I was just looking after it for her until she came back. And then we were on the phone one day close to her return date. And I was saying, oh, I'll have to fill you in on X, Y, and Z. And she said, actually, Sharon, I'm not coming back. And I was like, oh, right. Well, you could have knocked me down with a feather. So then I had to make the decision. Is this something I want to compete for publicly? And I did so. And um, yeah, I've been the CEO then since May 2012. Brilliant, brilliant. Amazing how you're just kind of in that role. Nice to be able to try it on for size. Um, Michelle, I'll go back to you in terms of, I suppose, your journey is how you became a leader in the first place. I mean, you're CEO now, but you were telling me you started off as a contractor. Um, was CEO always going to be the prize? Was that the ambition? Never the ambition, Laura. Uh, never the ambition, I think. Um, I never consciously became a leader. I just, uh, through various changes in roles and, and working, um, ended up in a leadership role. I love the leadership role. It's a great role to have, but it was never my intention to be there. Um, and I never, I suppose, short of my current role where I actively decided to um, apply for the position following um, the previous CEO leaving, um, I'd never chosen a leadership role up to that. I suppose I'd, I'd always worked hard in the role that I was in, whether it was a contractor or whether or not it was the head of finance here. I was finance director for a short while as well. Well, finance director for five years. But those roles were always, I suppose, a development of um, my existing work. And it was just hard work got me into leadership roles, really. Mm -hmm. And what do we say to women then to, you know, put their name in the hat? How do we encourage them into more leadership? I think we have to encourage women to take that step out. We're, we're always nervous of, you know, throwing our name into the hat and saying, I want to lead. There's no shame in wanting to lead. Um, in fact, it's a great place to be um, because you influence things and, and uh, you influence the future when you're in a leadership role. But I think women need to learn to put themselves forward and, and you need to be honest with yourself and say, do you know what, I would like to do that. And I think if more women did that, we'd have more women in leadership roles. Excellent. And tell us what does leadership mean to you? I, I suppose, you know, you're not in, in what we would call an entrepreneurship role per se, but you've a good background in terms of project leadership and coaching, that kind of thing. 
Please. Yeah, I'm, I suppose when I when I looked at the panel, you know, the three ladies on the call today, I saw all CEOs and I thought, well, that's not, I suppose that's not the role I'm in. I'm not, not in, in a leadership role. The role I'm in is as the head of the financial planning in, in the university, which involves looking at all of the forecasting, the budgeting, the, the, the you know, the kind of the, how are we spending the, the money of the, of, of the university and how do we do it in, a, in, the, in the best way possible. But um, I suppose in, in previous roles, um, when I was a bit like, I suppose a bit like Sharon, when she was asked to, to move into the, the role of, of CEO where she is now, when I was with, um, it was called Sound and Media, which is the subsidiary of the, of the Virgin Group, and I was with them, I, I, I was actually out on maternity leave. I was their financial controller. So I joined that company as a financial controller and I was actually out on maternity leave. My daughter, my second daughter was only two months old and the director resigned. So he left, he was, he was leaving, leaving the company, going on to another role. I was approached whilst on maternity leave to say, would I consider the role? Now, of course, my, my immediate reaction was, you know, that's not, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready for that role. I, you know, I, I wasn't long, I wasn't long in the company. I was probably less than a year in the company at that point. And I thought, I'm not ready. I haven't learned everything. I don't know at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know at all before I go into that more senior role. Um, and it's, it's what I've kind of since learned, learned to, to, to understand to be kind of that kind of imposter role that you kind of think I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going into it, but it's, they're going to find me out at some point. But I, I, I suppose I have tended along, the, along my journeys to go with my gut and to go with, what is it that I it kind of resonates with me? And I feel like, well, if, if other people see, see something in me, well, then I should believe that. I should take that, take that on board and go with it. So, so as a result of that, I, I took that, I took that and I went, went into that role and was there for, I suppose it was three or four years before we made that move to come back to Ireland. So I think it's, it's kind of trust your gut as a leader, uh, uh, you know, or, or even, even in your, not even as a leader, trust your gut in your decisions that you're going to make and that, that will, will stand to you. Yeah, and trust yourself as well. You know, I mean, if, if we only do a job that we're 100% qualified for, we're not learning anything then. We're not pushing ourselves. We're not challenging ourselves. Or we're, we're not opening our minds to new opportunities that we might find out we're brilliant at, but we never had an opportunity to find out. Um, you know, there's great excitement in learning and giving it a go. And the other thing is, certainly for my journey anyway, is people are delighted when you do it. It's like when I went out, they, they came out of the woodwork to support me um, doing something that, that was kind of crazy and ridiculous to do with the time as well. But you get so much goodwill, I think, from people along the way. They're rooting for you. They really want you to do well. Um, Sharon, who, I, I suppose, not to get into COVID or anything as well, but I suppose, you know, the music industry and particularly the live music industry has really, um, I suppose, has been hugely impacted. And, and obviously in terms of the, the well-being of musicians and performers and everything as well. Would you say the last 12 months have presented a few challenges? <laughs> um, you know, what's been the greatest challenge and, and what are we going to do about it? Well, absolutely. I mean, the last year has been one of the most interesting years thus far. I mean, it's it's a really fascinating time to live through as a human being, but certainly in our sector, as it has often been said, one of the first to close and will be one of the last to fully recover. So um, I suppose I was lucky in that we have a small team of nine and we were able to adapt quite quickly to the situation. I mean, we're, we're out of the office. This is week 52 away from our office home, which is the National Concert Hall building, which as a cultural institution was closed that first um, Friday. So we were able to, I suppose we were mid our regular touring season. So we're bringing artists in from the States and Europe and bringing them all around Ireland, working with about 40 partner promoters, art centres, local authorities, etc. So that's what we would have been doing um, last April, May. And instead of that, we had to just you know, sit down and, you know, like you say, supporting musicians was one of the critical pieces. Um, and the first thing in our mind, what can we do? What can we develop quite quickly that will help support musicians here as well as stay connected to audiences. So one of the very first things we did was um, develop a commissioning project for broadcast. So we commissioned 24 musicians and composers to write new music, which they, we had a DIY ethic to it. They had to film themselves in their homes actually performing the piece, which we broadcast out to audiences. 
we hoped and well we were right in hoping that there would be some light by summer and so we planned a concert series for august and so when the doors momentarily opened we had five concerts around the country with the series we called live and local and um we did other things like we launched an instrument hub which basically is a one-stop shop on our website where you can learn how to get your hands on a musical instrument so we're working with professional uh, musicians on the one hand but trying to increase music making across the country on the other hand so we we actually in some strange ways enjoyed well we enjoyed the challenge if not the the problems we we faced as the year went on and you know we were pushed in different ways that we wouldn't have thought of initially so we're still in that process very much but i do hope that you know again there will be brighter days ahead and by summer we will have live music because i suppose we're very much about the in the room experience you know there will be digital that will be part of our future yeah. we to get back to live in the room concerts with musicians and audience yeah i think we're all looking forward to that aren't we it sounds like all those musicians have been beavering away but ready to delight us when we're when we're allowed into the same room as them michelle you had a bit of a trial by as well. I mean, you were only four weeks in the job thinking I'll, I'll get myself, ease myself under the desk and, and you had very big high heels to follow, I suppose, and Mary Ann as well. And then four weeks later, obviously, the lockdown was announced. Um, how would you describe your leadership style? Is it what you thought it would be? Or, you know, I suppose there's been a lot of crisis management maybe that you hadn't foreseen as a result. I think it, it was an interesting journey, yes. The um, lockdown came in four weeks after I was appointed into the role and, and thinking our CEO had been here for 11 years and I thought, you know, I just, I was covering on an interim basis in the initial period and I thought I'll just not rock the boat now for a few months and let everything settle down and, you know, in six months time, you know, take a, a look at what changes I wanted to make into the business and then COVID happened and immediately we had to go into crisis management. I think it probably benefited me in some ways because it meant I, I had to stand up and start uh, taking steps to protect the business. So I had to assume the leadership role really quickly because naturally enough everybody is looking to the CEO, what do we do now? Our sales have disappeared, We've, the factory is quiet. I think it meant that I took up the role a lot quicker than I would have done had it all just been nice and rosy and relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, and it changed the way I approach things because yes, we did have the crisis management and that went on for a number of months. But as we got into budgeting process and, and looking towards 2021, you realize you can't continue to manage a business in crisis management mode, you have to move forward. So it gave me real opportunity then to to look at the business and organize things and, and see the opportunities that were there for growth for the future. So it was it was tough, there's no two ways about it, but I think it, it made me take the leadership role quicker than I would have done without the crisis. Mm. Brilliant. Um, Nicola, I suppose we're, we can be leaders in, in so many different ways, you know, we're leaders at work, we're leaders at home, um, and obviously, you know, as, as women, we kind of take a lot of that on as well. Can you tell me a bit about how your two worlds collide or mesh together in that context, and even how do your kids perceive that? Um, I, my, I have two, two daughters who are 21 and almost 20, um, and then two, two younger children at 13 and 11 and I suppose the, it's the two older two that as I've gone along um, through 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 my, my working life really as they have grown up with me grown up through their teens I've, I've realized how much of an inspiration I have to be to them and I want to be I it's it's more than what I want to be so what we find here in, in our house is that we have great conversations around the table there literally are kind of good good robust discussions where I, they're very different to what I would have had as a child, you know, very different. There would have been, there's a lot more engagement, there's a lot more listening to what our children want to say to us and, and having having kind of in-depth in discussions in that way. And, and that's no different, I find, to what I do at work. You know, I, I, I listen. I, I have found that it kind of in, over the past number of years, it's, it's involved a lot more of, of kind of listening to what people want, collaborating with people, 
it, it, it just, it, you can help to bring people on a hell of a lot quicker if you're collaborating with them. And um, I mean, my, my, my daughter, I was involved um, with a, a project in, in the university, which was around gender equality. And my 14 year old daughter was doing a, a, a report for her junior search. And she had to do a, a, I suppose, a presentation. And, and she could have chosen any topic. But because we'd been having kind of just an interesting, what she felt were interesting conversations, and she was riveted by them and just interested in the whole, whole area of gender equality, that that's what she picked. She picked that as her topic. And I was like, I was so, I, I was delighted for her and just so I felt, I felt, wow, I'm doing a good job here. You know, not only am I doing a good job at work, but I'm doing a good job here with, with my daughter. So it's, it's, it, it, was, it was brilliant. So I find the two very much come together for me in, in, in my roles. There's, there's very little difference as to how I, how I, I suppose, interact at home or, or in the office. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Uh, and I think, I suppose, you know, I certainly had people who helped me or inspired me or encouraged me along the way. And we have, we have a responsibility, I think, to pay it forward to the next generation of women coming, you know, and, and that starts with our daughters, I suppose, really, as well. Um, I mean, you know, none of us arrive home at five or six o'clock and go, I'm a leader, you know. <laughs> we don't, but like, you know, do, do your kids know that that is your role or are you just mom or, you know what I mean? Are they inspired by that side of things? Well, I got a text, they are. I mean, um, the, the one of them sent me a text this morning. She said, I am her inspiration, you know, so and she's listening today. So thank you for that. Oh, um, for that, that kind of just, it's just a sense of encouragement. They do, I don't know whether they see me as a, as a leader per se in the kind of, the, as a leader, but they do see that I suppose there's a passion in what I do and that comes across. And I, I, I feel that that, that that passion and, and enjoyment in, in what I do they, they they feed off that. I, I see them. I see them feeding off that in their in in I suppose in how they how they interact with their friends as well, and um, that they have kind of gotten some some great insights from from me, which is you know. Mm. That's brilliant. Um, we have a question in here actually from Carl. Carl Daly, thanks very much. And could I encourage this man, there's, there's 52 people listening in today, so I'd, um, I'd welcome any questions that you have for the panel this morning. I'm, I'm sure they'd be brilliant. Um, Sharon, there's a question here for you, just in terms of, are artists getting the recognition and support from the government? Um, you know, they're, they're asking people to upskill maybe, or whatever it is. How would you respond to that? Well, I suppose I would say the Arts Council has um, been given a significant increase in funding this year. So that's very, very welcome. And there have been various other initiatives, but I suppose they won't, you know, there's never enough, I suppose, to support everyone. In terms of asking people to, if we're talking about retraining, I mean, that's, I mean, that's an insult as an idea, you know, if that is your vocation and you find your purpose in life, why should you, you know, have to go and, and, you know, reinvent yourself to be someone else? I mean, artists are constantly developing new strands to their work, whether it's teaching or, you know, most of them have portfolio um, work. So, you know, they're, they're doing a lot already to earn a living and to then, you know, the concept that they might have to go and train as something else entirely mm -hmm. is, is definitely very problematic. But by definition, they're the most creative part of our society. I think they could potentially, there's a, as a, there's a resource there that we can tap into to come up with creative ways into the future and things that we do and how we go about them. Um, Sharon, is there anyone in particular that inspires you as a leader and why? Yes, I was, well, I was thinking about that particular question, actually, and going back to the Women in Leadership Conference in Barcelona in, I think, 2019, there was an amazing woman who spoke at that conference, um, a Spanish woman called Carlotta P, who was the founder of Hola Luchi, which is a green energy company, and she told the story of how, returning from maternity leave, she basically got the sack from her old job, which, she, you know, she'd been in the industry for 10 years and she described herself as a sort of a round, uh, round peg in a square hole. And so she promptly went off and uh, set up her own company. And in her words, she wanted to create a purposeful environment 
where empowering people is the co at core of strategy. And her mantra was very much everything is possible. So um, that was I mean, that was the standout speaker. Actually, it was a conference, I should say, run by Timony, which brought about 20 of us out uh, in January 2019. And yeah. she was just incredible. Her energy, um, her outlook, her thinking about how to manage her team. I mean, she has nearly 200 people working in the company, but there's, I mean, it was very knitted, I felt as a team, but at the same time, giving people a lot of autonomy um, to have a life as well as a, a working life. So yeah, she's, she's a standout person for me, for sure. Brilliant. God, it'd be great if we can all go back out to Spain with Timony. <laughs> nice, yeah. I'll be the first one to sign up. Michelle, yeah, can I come back to you for a second? Um, you know, have you encountered critics or skeptics along the way? I suppose there's a stereotypical view as to how women should be or act. And, and maybe when we're in leadership roles, we don't come across as maybe likable or, you know, if, if, if men maybe do the same thing or make the same decisions, maybe they're perceived differently. Has, has that been your experience at all? It's not really, Laura, to be honest with you, but then I'm possibly not as aware of things like that as I, I could be. I've very much been, um, I've been surrounded by opportunity um, and, you know, I've, I've never had that kind of male, female, gender thing put at me on, in my career. I've worked hard. I've had opportunities to progress. Um, and from what I've seen, you know, I've not experienced it from a gender bias point of view. I've not had the skeptics. You will get small elements of it from time to time, but they've been very, very small. But overall in my career, I, I've not encountered it um, or certainly not been aware of it if it was there, but that could just be a testament to um, my own oblivion if it was there. But, you know, I've never considered it as being an issue. Therefore, I've assumed other people wouldn't, see it as an issue so you know from my own experience not too much i've been i've worked in both male and female uh dominated industries and uh maybe been lucky that it hasn't been an issue yeah would any would sharon or nicola would you like to come in on that one well, I suppose the arts, certainly arts management, um, there are lots of female leaders in the arts. It wasn't always the case, but mm. um, certainly today, yeah, I can think of, you know, leaders of various other funded arts organisations who are women. Um, I suppose where the sector is focused at the moment is equality, inclusivity and diversity in general um, for the arts. And um, that's a process being I suppose very much championed by the Arts Council and something we're all involved in at the moment and um, I think that will really enrich the sector in due course but you know as a as a female leader you know I, I haven't encountered I, or as Michelle said been particularly aware of any issues in that respect. Thank you. Nicola I know you were on the task force for gender equality in NUIG um, what can we look forward? I suppose, you know, obviously the, the university itself has, has changed a lot and has taken on board a lot of the recommendations for that. Have you seen that really kind of have an impact now? What does that look like for, for leadership and, and, and gender equality into the future? Yeah, I was the, uh, I suppose, it, again, that this was one of the roles that I, I took on, which was completely you know, left field to what my, my, my existing role was at the time in, in the university. So I took on project manager of the task force that was created in 2015, a gender equality task force as a result of an, an equality case that was taken by Micheline Sheehy Skeffington. But taking that, taking on that, that role as a project manager, it was, I suppose it really opened my eyes into the, like, like, the, like the, the other speakers, I haven't encountered it. I haven't encountered any kind of gender bias in my previously because I suppose I always worked in, in on the finance side and in finance industries where there was always you know two of my previous bosses had been had been you know female financial directors so I, I had seen it I suppose to me I was looking upwards and saying yeah I, it can be done I can I can achieve that and um, but what I suppose what came across as being part of the task force was that if you do want to bring in change bringing it in from the top down was where you needed to start 
And what we started in the university with was a, a vice president for equality, and diversity and inclusion. And that just was pivotal to bringing in that change was having the person in that role at the top table. So having them there so that they, they could ensure that when decisions are being taken, that their voice is heard and that it's, it's an equal voice at that, at that senior management team. So as a result of that, then we could be, we could be happy leaving the, because my role is, as I said, was in, as a project manager, but you could leave the recommendations knowing that they were in safe hands, that there was, there was the, the university had taken it on board, that they were going to implement them as best they could. You know, and implement them. They have, you know. I mean, they've, they've, they, you know, they've, they've done an awful lot in in around it, and lots more to do. But you know, there's and there's ever evolving, you know, issues come up that have to be dealt with. But by having that person at the top table, it's it's, it's helping to achieve it. I mean, there was one, you know, there was one one request that I mean, I wasn't. This wasn't strictly a recommendation. I mean, it was it was a recommendation to people women more visible in the university, right? But we had one of our rooms, one of our um, our main boardrooms. Which um, and it was fab fabulous room, right in the in the Aula Max, in the uh, in the quadrangle rather. So it's a building built in 1845, 46 onwards. Fabulous building, but a grand room were all the portraits of all the previous presidents of the university. Now they were dated right back to when the, the university first started, but that was the room that people would come into to do some of their interviews for their jobs. And on that wall were you know however many 15 men, really big imposing imposing portraits. So one of the decisions that, that were taken actually by our, our new president when, when he arrived was to take all the portraits down and to rehouse them around the university. It wasn't that we wanted to hide the portraits, but to make that room less imposing so that when you go in, it was one of our main boardrooms, when you go in, it's, you're, you're not then being intimidated by, um, by those portraits. And it's those little things, it's those little changes that resonate with, with um, have resonated with the, kind of the, the, the staff and, and students in, in the university. Excellent. I'm just conscious of time now. God, we could keep this going all morning. Um, Michelle, is there any one piece of advice that you would give to our leaders coming up behind us, the next generation? One piece of advice. I suppose to be aware and I suppose to, to believe in themselves. Um, People need to trust their instincts. I think, uh, Nicola, you mentioned it earlier on, trusting your gut and trusting your instinct um, and believing in the opportunities that are there for people. Um, we have lots of very, very talented women in business right throughout Ireland and right throughout the world. Um, they need to believe in themselves. They need to put themselves forward. And I always think that if, if, if you're sitting at a table and you kind of think there's a voice in inside your head saying, I'd like to do that. Well, then we need to make every opportunity to take those opportunities as women and uh, and make ourselves known. So, you know, awareness of what the opportunities are and courage to take them when they're there. Excellent, thank you. Um, Sharon, have you any projects coming up that you'd like to tell us about? Obviously, digital music is a big thing. Um, Yes, yes, it is. And as I said, that will be part of the future, um, whatever which way you look at it. Yes, I mean, we've one project, for example, coming up this year that, um, again, as a result of COVID, it's asked us to relook at how we deliver musician residencies, which ordinarily would be about a musician being placed in an art centre and working for a six month period with the local community and putting on a series of concerts at the same time. So instead of an annual residency, um, as we would in every, I suppose, previous years, um, we're actually running, uh, or at least we're in the process of putting together a national residency program, working with seven different uh, partner venues around the country. So we hope to be uh, talking about that publicly very soon. And I suppose we're using digital technology as well as I suppose there's a lot of emphasis on developmental work for musicians at this time that can be shared more widely later. So it's I suppose we're recreating the model, which is very exciting, and also to be doing a national programme rather than a single residency. So multiplying from one to seven is very exciting as well. So we're really looking forward to getting into the detail of, of all of that with our partners this year. Well, you've a busy few months ahead of you, so and I, I suppose you, you've got 
the the added responsibility of you know it's it's an it's a it's not for profit. You've you've you know you've you've accountability there and and the transparency element and everything as well. And ultimately, your your business is about relationship building, really, isn't it? And and, and it's difficult to do that, I'm sure, on a remote basis all the time now. Absolutely, yes. I mean, our ethos is partnership, partnership, partnership. So you know, I can. I can't even think of a project we're doing without a partner um, somewhere. And I suppose, yes, you know, we, we have Zoom, I suppose. And while there are limitations, you know, you can also get to meetings via Zoom that you may not have been able to get to in ordinary times. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. There's the forces of that as well. But yes, um, I mean, I think, I mean, because we work in partnership all of the time, we have very strong relationships there, which will stand the test of this period, you know, so, um, and we've been working and talking to our promoters all the way through this, because we've been constantly like everyone else shifting goalposts and replanning and deplanning and replanning. So, you know, we're, I suppose we're all working very closely together and, you know, that's, that's been, I suppose, kept us, you know, a can do attitude to get us through this has really kept us all going. Thank you. Um, question here from Declan Dooley. Nicola, maybe you'd like to answer it. What advice would you give young women entering the workforce or considering future career paths for 21? And I suppose I'm conscious you've recently done an executive coaching course and obviously coaching is, is part of um, your, your, your thinking and your ethos and, and your development of women and your daughters. So um, what advice would you give young women going into the workforce or furthering their career? from now on? Uh, yes, I've recently just completed um, a diploma in, in um, executive coaching. And what that is, I suppose, the, the advice that I would, I would give, and it was something that I didn't have from the get-go, was find yourself a coach or a mentor. Um, I, since, since finding one myself, it has just been invaluable to me helping to navigate my way around various decisions that I, that I need to make. Or trying to understand current situations that, that I may be in. It, it just, it allows you that freedom to talk. And sometimes what we find is that we're not given the opportunity to, to talk. You know, pe people don't listen. They, they just don't, don't listen. So when you, when you don't have the, when, you, when you're given that opportunity in that space, be it for a half an hour or an hour to sit down with somebody, and they ask you those questions that just might prompt you in a different way to think about something that, that you, 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 you were trying to puzzle out. It, there's a great freedom in it. There's a great, it's, it gives you a great opportunity at the end to go, ah, oh, that's, that's where I want to go. And invariably what, what you find when, when you're coaching people is that the answer lies within themselves, right? Mm -hmm. We all have the answers within ourselves in general. And um, so finding that, that, you know, finding a coach and finding somebody who can help you unlock that within yourself is, is just pivotal. And, and that's, Kind of on a coaching side but but equally kind of if you can find yourself a mentor in your organization when you when you get into the organization look look around you look at your peers look at because it can be can be a peer or it can be somebody more senior to you find somebody in the organization that you look up to that you think oh gosh i like what they've done i like how they've gotten gotten to where they've gotten to today let's see will they help me because invariably people love talking about you no know, we're here today talking about our stories they love talking about their stories how they've got to where they are and they want to pass on that information they want to help especially you know especially people who are working with you in the organization that you want that people want to help each other out so so find that mentor or find that coach and it will absolutely unlock your potential that's brilliant. I think that's a lovely way maybe we'll wrap up today, ladies. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your thoughts and your leadership journeys and your thoughts for the future. I think if anything comes out of it is that, you know, we've we've all had, you know, I suppose none of us went straight up the ladder. It was a bit of a, a kind of a, a jungle gym. You kind of went down little alleyways and that's kind of been the best part. And you met some wonderful people along the way who inspired us. And I think, you know, we, we have a responsibility at this stage to do the same for the people coming behind us, male or female, to encourage them and show them what they can do and what they can achieve. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be hard. You know, it's kind of, we've made mistakes and maybe we kind of prevent a few more from being had. If people would only say hello and, and ask us the question, we're always happy to do that. 
thanks a million to Timothy for organising this and setting everything up. I thought I think I haven't broken Zoom yet anyway. And uh, Maria O'Callaghan is under no threat, obviously, by the end of this morning either. Um, so thanks to everybody who put in questions and, and put in insightful thoughts and everything as well. Um, finally, just to let you know that there is more Timothy coming up that um, you might like to participate on. So the next is Wednesday, the 24th of March. There's an alumni masterclass dealing with innovating in challenging circumstances and that's with Professor Rory MacDonald of Harvard Business School who's brilliant, he was there uh, when we did it in 2019 um, and there's another webinar coming up shortly as well by E. Dunn John's daughter so the okay. date confirmed um, she's CEO of ESA in North America and obviously a uh, very interesting lady as well so um, thanks again for participating this morning and this afternoon and uh, happy International Women's Day.